Hello everybody and uh, my name is David Lamb and um, I'm introducing uh, a message to you which actually I've had a lot of good feedback already about and um, this is a subject that I heard uh, expressed by a prophet um, in New Year's Eve service in our church in, in Ashford Christian Fellowship and the message was amazing he said okay we ask God for promises we receive promises from the Bible we decree promises and uh, we look to God to fulfill our dreams, to fulfill our vision. And the amazing thing is we very rarely address what might hinder the fulfillment of that promise, the fulfillment of that dream uh, and that vision. And so we started to actually address, and you'll find on this message, it's addressing one hindrance um, regarding uh, the provision, because when we look at the provision, for instance, of finances, a lack of finances is a major hindrance to people fulfilling the dream, the vision, and the and the promise that God is given to them. Um, it's not, uh, re it's rarely addressed, you know, it would be addressed in some ways with, um, say, a tithing message or an offering message. I haven't actually addressed it in that light or in that way. What I've done is I've, I've addressed it in, in, uh, in this measure to say, look, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So it's a question of the Father providing for his children. Um, every father, every earthly father that's a good father, will provide for their children. And not only will they provide their basic needs, but they will provide gifts and surprises. So God wants us to actually break through in knowing the character of the Father. We say, those of us that are born again, those of us that know the Lord, He's our Father. He's our Daddy. So therefore, breaking through in the aspect of character, and I'll give a, a short testimony uh, when when I first got married, my wife found me like a wild man. She said he's like a wild man. He just listens to God and then he'll go off and preach in different nations. He hasn't got any money, uh, but God always provides. Sometimes at the last minute, but God always provided. Um, and people used to say also, how can you enjoy so many exotic holidays? So number one, the provision to go our preaching wasn't difficult. God is a provider. And when you step out, and you know, this is the year of the open door. When you step out and go through the door that God has put before you, God says that he will provide as we are obedient to fulfill the promise and to fulfill the vision and the, and the call of God. So where we're coming to see God's provision, but a, a lot of people, they don't understand. So where we're coming to my wife, um, she had a fear because her father was alcoholic and spent all the money on drink and then she would go to bed hungry. She couldn't pay the school fees. So she has the conception <coughs> that her father didn't provide for her. I said to um, Joyce, do a study of God's provision. And she did an, ex exhaustive, an exhaustive study of God as father. God as provider, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and then God began to seed her and speak to her heart, and eventually she became stronger even in this than I, I was, because I was believing God for provision from the tithing scripture, bring your tent into the storehouse, and God said, I'll open the windows of heaven and provide a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive. I stand on that, I see the provision, I see God's hand, <clears throat> but she's saying, when I said to her, come on, let's fast and pray. We've got bills to pay. Let's pray some money in. She said, I don't need to do that because God is my father. He will never, he never see me go hungry and he will never forsake me. He will never abandon me and he will pay those bills. And he always does and he always did. And so my wife is actually farther ahead than I am um, on the revelation of father. You know, so... Number one, do you know the Father? Do you know Him as your provider? Do you know how generous? The second question would be, do you know the generosity of the Father? Third question would be, 
Are you expecting the Father to be generous to you? Or do you think that you have to do all this by yourself? You hold ten, two jobs, three jobs. <clears throat> you try to make ends meet by working extra hours and so on. I'm not saying we shouldn't work hard. I'm not saying that there isn't a scope for us to earn. But, you know, particularly those who are on the low, or low income spectrum, you never, and even those who are on a higher income spectrum, you're never going to be paid by your employer um, extra, in a sense. He'll pay enough to keep you, but he won't pay enough to actually prosper you. There are a few jobs that do that, but there aren't many. Okay, and that's usually specialised jobs. You get paid on the specialisation. And so when you're looking at this whole subject, we have to have a breakthrough in our understanding that money can come in diverse ways other than our income. Okay, if you're working on income, expenditure, and you do that monthly, recommend it that you do that. But if you just work on your income and expenditure, you're not going to have necessarily any flat, any, flat, uh, <laughs> any fat in there to pay for your university, your kids' university fees, to pay for marriages when your kids grow up and get married, if you're married, or to pay for funeral expenses. And some countries very expensive, including in this country. So you're paying for funeral, you're paying for gifts, surprises, holidays, and when you've got the income and expenditure and you're just living by that. One time um, I, I was working, living by faith, from 1977 until 1990. Didn't get paid. All right, so God provided, and he's a good provider. When I came on to a salary in 1990, I was employed by a church uh, as an evangelist, came on to a salary, I began to do income expenditure. And then God uh, began, after, after a couple of months, God said to me, this is not the way I taught you to live. Um, oh, don't misunderstand, it's not wrong to do that, but that's a limitation. I, I was limiting myself now to income, okay? And God said, that's not the way I taught you, because God taught me and now my wife to pray in money. And he taught us first, we used to pay, pray in pounds. That's where we started. And we used to see five, ten... 15 whatever pounds coming in and then we went to pray hundreds God told when I was meditating on the tithing scripture he said believe me for hundreds now the challenge is and we've seen it happen we're believing for millions okay so where it comes to God being our provider and our father being generous the question is do you believe in his generosity do you believe he will give you gifts and surprises whether you're good bad or ugly. You understand, if your kids are naughty, you don't cut their legs off and then throw them out to punish them, to put them in the dark outside or something like that. You don't even stop, do you? Uh, generally speaking, you're not going to stop providing for them. You're not going to stop feeding them because they're naughty. You're not even going to stop giving them their birthday presents because they're misbehaved. So you're actually being generous to them whether they deserve it or not. Isn't that the heart of a father to the children? You want them to be good? Of course you do. God the Father wants us to be, you know, excellent Christians, etc. But sometimes we're not. So if you actually then exclude yourself from provision from the Father, because you're not matching up to what you think you should, you're not understanding the Father. He just loves to give handfuls on purpose. He loves to give treats on purpose. Exotic holidays on purpose. And I tell you, God is better at doing holiday than you and I are. And he's a great provider. And I've, t I've given testimony in the preach on how uh, God has provided for us. Some few testimonies there. But I want you, I'm going to pray for you. And Father, as the viewer and as, the, as those who listen online, listen on the, on the YouTube, uh, those who listen uh, on the radio, to these messages on Kent Christian Radio, I pray that you will prosper them. I pray, Lord, that you would cause them to have their eyes opened to the generous Father and be opened to have handfuls on purpose, to have gifts and surprises coming from Father that they never deserved, never earned, never worked for, 
but God himself gave to them as a grace and as a gift. And I pray that more and more people will enter into that revelation and that provision and they will experience the love and the goodness of the Father in Jesus' name. Bless you as you listen to this program today. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, we praise God. Today, I want to follow on with what um, Simon Breaker was bringing on New Year's uh, Eve, um, in our New Year's Eve celebration. And he was talking about um, people having vision, uh, people having, you know, um, dreams, goals, but then sometimes not knowing how to deal with hindrances. So there would be hindrances towards people fulfilling those dreams, fulfilling those goals, um, and I want to look at one aspect of that today. And uh, so I, I, I was just looking at the whole thing regarding what can hinder us fulfilling the promises of God. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you. And uh, this one is Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And uh, read from the Amplified Bible, same, same verse. And my God will liberally supply, fill until full, your every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Okay, so one of the things that can hinder, and I've observed this over many, many years, Christians in fulfilling the will of God, is a lack of finances. And so today I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how um, we can see the Father who is a generous father, begin to supply the needs so that we can fulfill the dream. There are many people, they struggle to pay their bills. Um, they struggle to keep afloat. And uh, God wants to come and break into that. He wants to do something with that. When you're living a life as a Christian, you're not living by yourself anymore. Amen? You're not having to do the best you can to make ends meet. You're not having to do the best you can to forge ahead with your life. You have covenants with God and you have this whole ability to draw on the resources of God. Okay, we got, that's where we're going. So Deuteronomy 8, 18, Amplified Bible again. Uh, but you shall remember with profound respect the Lord your God, for, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore solemnly promised to your fathers as to this day. When you read this in context, it's, it appears that the Lord is speaking to somebody who has been given wealth. Okay, so, but you remember, with profound respect, the Lord your God, when you have wealth, and what he's saying is that uh, you've got to remember where it came from. When you get it, you've got to remember where it came from. And he said it's God who gives power to make or create, or create the ability to get wealth, and it says that he may confirm his covenant. Covenant means agreement. That's our New Testament covenant with God. We have an agreement with God, and he said, I will confirm my covenant with you by providing for you financially. The Philippine scripture is all about finances. If you read in context, 
He talks about Paul being supplied by the church in Philippines. And Paul said, as you've supplied my need more than once, my God, Paul's God, is able to supply. He's able to supply every need. And so <clears throat> this is what um, I'm looking at. He says, my God shall supply. So let's have a look at that first. How many of you have seen God supply your needs? Okay, so we have a God that supplies needs. All right. I want to just say something about this. Very, very important. I don't believe in the gospel, receive Jesus and become rich. I'm not prosperity gospel on that side. But I think what's happened is because some people abused the gospel, then, the, then a lot of church just threw out anything about money. And it's almost like a swear word. Yet, you know, we all need to pay the bills. We all need to pay for the university fees when they come. We all need to pay for the weddings. We all need to pay for the funerals. And if you live in Nigeria, I understand the funerals are very expensive. And in Kenya as well, where I've been. Very expensive funerals. Bishop Boniface Matiso is having his second daughter married. He's got 1,500 people coming at least from different nations to the wedding. I'm telling you, it's expensive. Okay, so when we're looking to God to supply our needs, I'm thinking as well beyond immediate needs. How quick do the kids grow? Shoe changes, shoe size, clothes. Somebody did somebody a favor, uh, they, they, or they were prompted by God, I think, but they went and bought somebody the supply of, of um, what do you call the, they're not nappies anymore, are they? They're diapers, whatever they are, they're not diapers. What are they? You, yeah, a, a year's supply. Now, that, what, that's a great gift, isn't it? If you've got young ones, a year's supply. So when we're looking at actually um, God meeting our needs, I've got a few questions to you first. Are you willing to look at the Bible and talk about money? Hello? Okay, I wanted a response, you know. <laughs> Many Christians never fulfill the will of God in their lives. They never fulfill the vision, the calling, and the dreams, and, the, and their potential because of a lack of funds, a lack of finances. Is time actually to change this? Amen. So, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you asked your Heavenly Father specifically for this provision? Have you ever costed out what it's going to, what it's going to take to fulfill the dream? Probably most of you haven't. If you sit down and you cost out, what is it going to cost you? I'm sure you would sit down and cost out if you were going to take your driving lessons. I was just hearing uh, Aramis say 20 pounds an hour. It was a lot cheaper in my time, eh? 20 pounds, he said, is cheap. But then you've got a series, haven't you, of, of, of um, lessons. I'm sure you'll sit down and cost it out, isn't it? If you're going to get married, you're going to cost it out, yep. Yeah? Going to go on holiday, cost it out. Have you ever sat down and cast it out? What is it going to cost you to fulfill the dream? Why not? You've got to know where you're going. You've got to know what it's going to cost you. You've got to set your goals in place, haven't you? So you're having steps towards a vision. It starts somewhere and ends somewhere. It doesn't actually end, you know, at the end result. You've got to take steps towards the fulfillment of a vision. So, number one, what's it going to cost you? If, you, um, if you're going to, if you're going to uh, go and see your dad, if you have a dad now, you're going to see your dad, and you want something, and your dad says, what, what is it, what do you want? But you're, you're not going to tell dad specifically what you want. So dad's not a mind reader, so he says to you, come on, tell me what you want. If you're not specific, you probably, your dad's not going to know what you want. Do you remember going to dad when you were a kid? Ask him for the bike. 
asking for whatever it was you, you were after. Nowadays, it would be technology probably. You're asking for something, and then you're looking for Dad to provide that for you. What about Heavenly Father? Do you think he might want us to ask specifically for what we need? Do you think there's, this is relational? This is not just business as usual. This is relational, isn't it? So when you're actually then costing out what vision is going to cost you, and you're going to go and see the Father, and you're going to ask the Father specifically for what you need. There was a, a famous minister in South Korea, biggest church in the world, um, when he started off, he was um, very, very poor. There was a, a lot of poverty in his life and in the life of his congregation. And he, and he asked God simply for a bicycle, a table, and a chair. And he knew that God heard his prayer, but it didn't come. And when he went to the Father and he, he said, I know you answered my prayer. What's going on? Why haven't I got my bicycle table and chair? And, and the, the, the father spoke to him and said, Son, there are so many different kinds of bicycles, so many different kinds of chairs and tables. What kind do you want? And he asked for a certain table. He asked for a certain, he wanted an American bicycle. He said they were harder wearing. And he wanted a chair with wheels and stuff like that, so he could move around like a big shop. But the, God gave him those three things, and he learned a lesson. When you're looking at the life of Jesus Christ, when people came to Jesus, he said, what can I do for you? You imagine a blind man coming to Jesus. Jesus can see he's blind, and he, and he says to the blind man, what can I do for you? And the blind man says, I want to see. He's looking for something specific. And of course, you can't assume anyway that everybody that comes for prayer because they're blind wants to be healed. Um, but Jesus was identifying what the heart was. He was identifying what do you need? What do you want me to do for you? What do you need from the Father? Don't you think you should be praying? Say like you've got small ones now. Don't you think you should be praying into their university stuff in advance? Don't you think you should be praying into those marriages in advance? Why would we wait till the pressure comes and the time comes and then we start to get serious? Okay, so we're looking, number one, have you asked your Heavenly Father specifically for the provision? Number four here, oh, sorry, yeah, never mind. Numbers. Do you know the Heavenly Father's generosity? I'll stop on this one. I'll park on this one a little bit. Do you know Heavenly Father's generosity? Have you got that in your experience? He's generous, and Mark described it already this morning. He's generous with his hugs. Hello. I did a post not just long ago. I said, sometimes only a hug from the Father will do. Sometimes it don't, it's not a word from anybody else that would do it. It's a hug from the Heavenly Father. Sometimes when, he, when, he, when the prodigal came back to him and he said, he fell on his cheek and kissed him. He kissed his cheek. He fell on his neck and kissed his cheek. This is relational stuff. Father is generous by nature. He gives handfuls, the Bible says, on purpose. Every father gives treats to their children on purpose, whether they're good, bad, or ugly. And you know your kids can be all of that in the same day, even in the same hour, right? So you're giving to your children. Why? Because you want to be generous with your children. Most of you would be even more generous if you had the resources, now, I'm not saying we're like Father Christmas, that we spoil our kids like that. Anyway, Heavenly Father is generous. Joyce and I, we were, we were dropped off in a, in a village by, the, by a vicar. We were working, I was working as an evangelist in the, in the inner city of London with a, with a vicar in the Anglican church, which grew to 
from a handful to about 500 people, people being saved all the time and marvellous things, miracles happening. And um, we were living by faith, so we were trusting the Lord for provision. And when we got dropped off, we didn't tell anybody that we didn't have money. Anyway, the vicar, as he dropped us off, he gave us 10 pounds, uh, which is not enough for us to be in Shear in Guildford in this, in, this, uh, in this flat and to eat all week and then to come back with the train fare back to London. So we didn't say anything. Anyway, when I went out, I went out for a walk. Joyce went, we bought a little bit of groceries. Joyce was doing cooking. I went out walking, and there's a beautiful church in the village. So I popped inside this church, and there was an open Bible on the lectern. I read this story about the provision for the widow. You know, the prophet came, and the widow was uh, supplied with oil. And I got excited, and I was thinking, what is that about? Why am I getting excited about this portion of Scripture? didn't know why. Anyway, the outcome was when I went back, um, and we sat down and we ate food. Joyce is the best cook. The food is is gorgeous. And so we ate the food. And the amazing thing is this. Every time over the next week we sat down, the food kept multiplying. Like we'd empty the bowl and then it would fill up again. We'd eat again, empty the bowl, and it filled up again. Wouldn't you like to know Father like that? And why not? It's not for one or two special people. Seriously, if you belong to the Father, you're his child, he looks after his children. My question is, and, and uh, are you expectant that the Father will give you treats on purpose? Somebody came up to, um, to us actually about 16 years ago in this church, and they said, um, God spoke to me, and uh, I want to send you on a holiday to a five-star hotel in, in Austria. I start crying, actually, <laughs> because I had a boyhood dream about going to Austria. And whenever I costed it out, priced it out, it's very expensive. And uh, so, you know, you, I, I just kind of... But the Lord knows, doesn't he, the dream and the, the desire and the things that are buried in your heart. She sent us, um, and we were in this, we were in this uh, valley where they did the sound of music, where they did the filming. You know, the Van Vrock, was it called? the? Yeah, yeah, that family and all that. So we were, where they escaped, we were in this valley. It could, it's idyllic. It's, we got bicycles, and we were cycling around this valley and around in Austria, and we were in this swank. We, we would, I mean, personally, I wouldn't pay that kind of money myself, but the Lord brought somebody who would. I mean, so we were in a five-star hotel and a, a swank place. And God just wants to take the lid off. He wants to give treats, gifts, and surprises. And he wants us to know him in that, in that measure of a father if an earthly father, a good one, can do that with his children, how much more God? How much more heavenly father? So uh, when, you, when we change our thinking, we'll be expecting something to come. What's going to come this year? I'm still talking about expectations now. When I came to the town 18 years ago, I asked God for a Christian doctor and I asked God for a Christian dentist. I got, uh, I didn't get Christian do doctor actually, but I got a, I got a great practice. Um, Christian dentist. I went along and there's an elder from another church who got his own practice and he refused to charge me. And he did my teeth for how long? Um, ching, 16 years. When he retired and I went and paid, I got a shock. And I, I kind of, I don't know, I was a bit blasé about it, I think. And in the end, I didn't see it as one of the father's treats or perks. But my teeth were done free and top-notch. 
Nothing substandard. He'd do crowns, he'd do everything. You know how much crowns cost, yeah? It's all expensive. And then, you know, my hairdresser refused to pay, charge me. So when I go to have my hair done or whatever, whatever, um, so I have to, anyway, he refused to charge me. I better leave it there. But then, these are the kind of things I want you to begin to expect. I'm in the, I filled up with diesel, and uh, I realized I hadn't got my credit card with me. So I'm looking for my credit card as I'm in the queue to pay for my diesel, and uh, I couldn't find it, so I phoned Joyce, and I said, Joyce, when I get to the till, can you pay by your credit card for the diesel? Because I've forgotten my card. When it got to the till, the, uh, the, the man said, it's been paid for. So I said, who, who paid for it? He said, that lady running up there. I said, just saw, it was somebody, a Christian from another church. I just saw her disappearing, and I knew who it was. Amen. In a supermarket, this has happened many times. The, the diesel thing has happened a number of times as well. I'm, I'm in the supermarket, Joyce and I shopping, minding our own business. A girl comes up. Um, she must be in the 30s and she's kind of shaking at the knees and she's obviously quite nervous about approaching us and she said, God told me to pay for your bill. Is it okay? I looked at her and I said, yes, my dear. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. And so when we got to the checkout, she paid, uh, she paid the bill. And it seems to be more of a pattern emerging because we lived by faith from 1977 full-time ministry to 1990 without a salary. So we know how to pray money in. We know how to live by faith. We traveled all over the world preaching gospel to, to many different nations. But you have to be able to develop your faith for God's provision. And the first thing you do when you're doing that is to look at the father's character and uh, you look at the father's generosity all right so do you expect gifts and surprises from your heavenly father i've asked you this question i'll ask again and we come back to it how much do you need in your life to fulfill the will of god okay i want to touch this one many just trust in their job their income Mostly, it's never enough. After living by faith and seeing the generosity of God, and you've got to believe where we started out when we got married, we didn't have a mattress that first night. <laughs> we were learning, and the second night somebody, a brother, pitched up with a mattress. We were on the springs the first night. It was, it, it was like we were learning something from scratch. And we were not ministers that time. Some people, they look at me, they say, yeah, but you're a minister of God will provide for you. No, there's no distinction actually in the Bible. He says God's children are God's children. Doesn't distinguish and say, oh, we'll provide for the minister, but not for the, not for the child, not for the ordinary believer. Doesn't say that. that makes no, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. It doesn't make any distinctions, is for everybody. Okay, so uh, I've got, I got a paid job. <laughs> it was 1990. Become an associate pastor in the Assemblies of God Church in Wembley. <laughs> and uh, and uh, when, before, we, before, we would job, before we got this job, the um, treasurer, he wrote to us, and he said, my son is very, very good at pastoring. He's a, lovely, he's a lovely man of God, but he's not very good with money. We haven't got any money to pay you. Don't come. That's what, we, that's what the treasurer wrote to us without the pastor knowing. The pastor invited us. He'd invited me so many times to become an associate pastor with him. And Lord turned him down because I was an evangelist. Anyway, when we went, he paid us £12,000 a, uh, £12, a year. 
1990 is not much, is it? 12,000 pounds a year. When we came down to look for a place to live, we went and looked at some new houses. We were looking around and there's this uh, guy smoking a cigar and he's selling the houses. And he said, how much do you earn? I said, well, um, I said, we live by faith. So we don't actually earn anything as such. She said, I said, but we are coming on a salary of 12,000 a year. He said, he looked at, he blew cigar smoke in my face. And he said, you're wasting my time. You're wasting your time. You're wasting petrol money. Why don't you go back to Birmingham? Because we're living in Birmingham and stay there. <laughs> you know, just, and, I, and when I came out, I said to Joyce, I said, this man has the ministry of encouragement. And... Uh, <laughs> And I said, I said straight away, I said, Father, you heard all of that. And within 10 days, we'd been given 21,000 pounds. We'd been given one gift of 10 grand, one gift of five grand, and other gifts of thousands. And, and even I told my nephew, my nephew's tall, Matt Truck, in the gym. When I, when I tell him about Jesus, he threatens me. He's, to he's towering over me and all this, and he's a biker, and he's got his leathers on and all that kind of stuff, and he said, don't give me any more books about Christianity. Don't talk to me about this anymore. And I told him, I said, listen, God will provide our deposits. And I said, even some people will come and give us interest-free loans. And he said, man, you are crazy. He said, you come from... Mars, he said, you're, for, you're, you're out of reality. He said, you're living on another planet. He said, God would, he said, he don't believe in God. He said, anyway, when God provided this 21,000 pounds in 10 days and we paid the deposit, we'd never had a flat. I was 40, 40 then, never had a flat, never had anything. We just traveled the world, preaching gospel, live out suitcases. Fun, great fun. So we, 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 uh, we put the deposit. He came to see the flat. He sat down and he was depressed, almost crying. And he said, you told me, you because 3,000, that was interest-free loan. He, t he said, you told me you'd get an interest-free loan and God would provide this deposit. He, and he sat there and he said, I'm at home in the council house. I'm depressed. And your God has provided you. He says, God will confirm his Covenant. My nephew came to Christ after. Not, no, that was a knock on, uh, many knock on things, mainly with Joyce. He was like Joyce, didn't like me. But mainly, yeah, he followed Joyce's life and all the provision. And he uh, later on came to know Jesus. When he came to know Jesus in my house, and uh, he, we prayed for him, he had gout, and God healed him of the gout straight away. And then his wife phoned me and said, what have you done to my Gerald? I said, what do you mean, what have I done? He said, I've never seen him. He stopped drinking, he stopped doing stuff. I just went and asked the family for forgiveness. Uh, just, just amazing. God is generous. God is generous. And I could actually keep you here probably half a year telling you stories. I'll tell you one more and then I'll move on. We're in Malaysia. We, um, we've been there three months, been preaching gospel there for three months. Joyce is Malaysian, loving it. Never want to come back here, actually. <laughs> Loved it there. And, and um, so we're preaching gospel. Then after three months, we need $1,000. You have to put deposit. It's a Muslim country to stay another three months. Um, out walking. People don't like walking much in Malaysia. I think, is it the same in some other countries? We like walking in the UK, but some people don't like walking in some cultures. Anyway, we were out doing a bit of walking because it's so hot. And a lady came, like dressed very poorly, with an envelope full of money. And I actually looked at her and I thought, I can't take money from this lady. And I ran away. She's running after me, chasing me. And she stopped crying. And she said, you're robbing me of my blessing. So like in the end, I touched. I just let her catch me up, put this money in my hand. 
and uh, then is part and parcel of going with that thousand dollars and provision for the time that we were out. We were out for a year and a month in Asia at that point, living by faith. And so many, many times we've had things stuffed through the door, even in this church. One night there came this big envelope. There was 2,600 pounds in this envelope, all in notes. I thought it was a bomb. I mean, it was like 12, almost midnight, and something bang through the door. And I went and said, Joyce, what's that? Scared to touch it. And there was a little note in there, Pastor, you need a new car. I'm not joking when I say I found money. When we were praying for money, I saw money in a tree. I went and picked it out of the tree there. I believe in money trees. I did. I picked out a £20 note out of the tree. Another time we were praying for the food that day. We didn't have food to eat that day. We'd invite people to come back and eat weekend. We didn't have food, money to feed them. But when they came, there was always, there was always food. £20 note wrapped around my foot, blew down the road, wrapped around my foot. And, you know, some bright spark said to me, did you take it to the police station? (laughs) Did you check the serial numbers? I said, no, my father, he provides, he looked after me. He's able to go and buy food for that day. Amen. Praise God. Joyce and I have been transported. We went to Brixton, in, we were living in Catford, we went to Brixton to preach, we only had the money to go one way. So God transported us home, supernaturally. I'm telling you, God is generous, he's adventurous, he's creative, he's innovative. Do we need a mindset change? Do we need to know the Father better? And I told you earlier, I'm not talking about God making us rich. I'm talking about God looking after our needs. And once our needs are looked after, we start to look after the needs of the world. Where's your trust? Is your trust in your job? What if you lost your job? How long would you survive without a job, with your finances? So we had this income and and expenditure, which I went into great detail I know we lived with this for about five, six months and then God spoke to me and he said, son, this isn't how I taught you to live. I'm, I'm, I'm all for income and expenditure. Do it right, do it properly. But God wants us to live above that, beyond that. To see more provision coming in than income and expenditure that's actually mapped out, that we know is coming in and we know is going out. God is more generous than that. How are we doing on the time? Okay. So, let's have, a, let's have a clear view about our funds, what we're going to need. Let's see the big picture of your life. This is really important. Where do you want to be in year one, in one year's time? Where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in ten years? And how are you going to get there? And how much are you going to need to get there? Who are you relying to fund you? It says in the Bible, have faith in God. It doesn't say that we should have faith in our employer. It doesn't say that we should have faith in our parents. It says have faith in God. Now, God, of course, provides through jobs. Of course, he provides sometimes through parents. But if our focus is there, if our trust is there, what happens if the funds stop? Have faith in God. We had an, we had an experience in Kingdom Faith. They live by money coming in and what's in the pot. He had 100 staff, Colin Urquhart's. And you get paid out of the common purse. One month, there wasn't enough money to pay the staff. So then the staff, they start to come in, they they get the wind up because they can't pay the mortgage. 
They can't pay their bills for that month. Colin, bless him, he always paid back in the end. He always believed God and paid his staff. But this time, there wasn't anything to pay. Joyce and I, we looked at each other, we just smiled and we said, another opportunity for God to provide for us. Because we'd walked that way, because we'd developed our faith, because we knew the Father, and listen, it, it isn't a question, don't misunderstand anything I'm saying, it's not a question of somebody got money and somebody who doesn't have money, the one who doesn't have money second class citizen and the one who has money is first class, that's rubbish. Not talking like that, not talking about that. You can have a lot of money and still be a stinker. You know what I'm saying? You, you, can, you can have a lot of money and be spiritual. We've met people in Malaysia and particularly Singapore had a lot of money, got saved, used their money for the glory of God. They were, they were spiritual. You can have no money and be spiritual. You can have no money and be carnal. We're talking about money is neutral. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself is neutral. It's what you do with it. If God can trust you, and get money into your hands. Develop your faith. Okay, I better finish. I better wrap this up. So, amen. I'm going to finish, I'm going to finish with this. Uh, would you dare to speak about Father's provision as if it was already there? I'm going to give you a prayer that I, that I learned from Kenneth Hagen, and it works for Joyce and I. We sit down, we ask God specifically for what we need. To the best of our ability, even if we're praying, we've, we've had seven cars given to us. We had the first car, which was a Volkswagen. Oh, no, no, Beetle, a red Beetle. You remember the Beetles? No, most of you don't. Anyway, the first one. It was, it was a, a, an old banged up beetle with the guys were going to Australia. We prayed for a beetle. I liked the beetle car that time. We prayed for this beetle car. And the guys took us out and they said, we're going to Australia. We want to give you this car. That was my first car. And we'd been given seven cars. And uh, we were given... Um, and we're being given amazing cars, enough. Okay, so where it comes to the provision, we have learned to be specific. So we're praying for a Volvo, and Joyce said, I want sunroof, I want something to play the, the, the tapes, the CDs, or whatever it was. I want a white one. Guess what we got? Four years old Volvo given to us. Somebody just came and gave us the keys. They said, uh, God told me to give you this car. 16,000 miles on the clock. That's poodling around. What's that? 4,000 4, a year. So we had this more or less amazing car, which we, which we used for a long time in the preaching gospel. We've had the bangers. <laughs> We've had the, those that shake, rattle, and roll. We had one French car, you have to go uh, 80, 90 downhill to get up the other real 50. So we've had our fun. We've had, we've had our, our, our fun times. But um, first part of prayer, be specific. Second point in the prayer, you've got to bind Satan off of your money. The devil will try to stop you fulfilling the will of God. He'll try to stop you fulfilling your destiny. He'll try to stop you by keeping you thoracic, keeping you poor. So you've got to deal with him. You've been given authority to deal with him. Don't be that kind of person that says, oh God, would you please take the devil away? No, Jesus has done everything. He conquered the devil, crushed him under your feet. He gave you the authority now to deal with him when he comes around your, your family or your area of influence. So you deal with the devil. You bind, you say, whatsoever you bind on earth is that which has already been bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth is that which has already been loosed in heaven. And then thirdly, the Bible says this in Hebrews 1.14. 
Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for the heirs of salvation? Finish with this one. These are the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits? You read Psalm 91, you say God commands his angels to take charge of you. Are they not all ministering spirits? He says in this particular verse, not to minister to you, but for you. So it's almost like they're waiting for your command. They are waiting for you to tell them they, they're there to fulfill the will of God, angels. They're not going to fulfill selfish desires or commands that are selfish, but the will of God. And when you're telling them the will of God, they will go and fulfill the will of God for your life. Many, many people, they don't even act like they've got angels. They don't believe they've got angels. And I tell you, we are surrounded by angels. You have to. Two-thirds of the angels did not fall. <coughs> One-third, of course, fell. And that's the enemy. So now you have the angels who are working with us to provide for us. Now, I then command my angels to go and bring my money in. If you struggle with that, ask the Heavenly Father to send your angels to bring your money in. Okay, we're going to finish. We're going to pray now. Amen? Is this good or is this good? Have you ever thought through about the costing? Can you just be thinking about that? Do some work on that this week, please. What's it going to cost you to fulfill the will of the Lord? And are you going to pray specifically? for Father to provide for you. Father, we come to present ourselves and you said you will confirm your covenant by that provision of finances, by meeting our needs. Forgive us that we have minimized and we've taken our lead from the culture we live in. We've taken our lead often from our lack. And I pray today, right now, for change to take place in our minds, in our hearts. We repent for minimizing. And now, Lord, we just begin to look to maximize with your character, with your generosity, with your provision. I pray that each one in the house will begin to break through and begin to see new things emerge to pay for their bills, to pay off their mortgages, to get them debt free, and to enable them to fulfill the will of God. Okay, think of a sum right now that uh, you know that you need. And I want you just to specifically ask the Father for that amount of money. Let it be beyond and above your income from your job, if you, do, if you work. Okay, now specifically ask the Father for that amount of money. Okay, now you can pray with me. Let's do this one together. You can pray after me, okay, like this. Of course, you're not forced to do this, but uh, I encourage you to do this. We command in the name of Jesus... Every demon to be bound, we command you to take your hand off of our money. We command you to go in Jesus' name. We break every hindrance from us for fulfilling the will of God. We command the angels that are assigned to us to go and bring in those finances. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stand a moment with me, please. We're going to take communion in a moment. Joyce brought to word uh, really about this, and uh, we are going to see change today. Do you remember before we got this building, the prophetess came and she made us walk through. She said, if you've got change in your pocket, not going to do that today. 
She got us to put all the change round the floor in a circle and we walked through the change and she said, change. And then uh, we got this building. Do you, do you, those of you who were here, you remember that? Everything changed that day. There was no way we got, could get this building. Everything changed that day. And today is going to be a watershed. Everything going to change today. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'm going to pray for you now. Because I've lived this life, and God has used me with the gift of faith in this way, I can release it to you. One of the things you must not do, please, I try to teach people, don't act like you know about this subject. Please, don't act like you know how to pray money in and everything when you don't. Please, be humble before the Father and say, teach me. Teach me how to do this. Just because you know some scriptures and you can quote some scriptures doesn't mean that you actually are living the experience. You may want to, but be humble. I taught people who are humble and they learn. I taught people who thought they knew it all and they don't learn this and they still don't have the provision even though they think they do. It's weird. So today, I decree change. I decree in the name of Jesus Christ that you will see the generosity of the Father in your family life, in your workplace. I decree many of you will become entrepreneurial and break through and have your own staff and your own companies. In the name of Jesus, I decree breakthrough in your ministry, Amen. in the dreams, in the vision, in the goals, in the will of God for your life. I decree there shall be no lack. Amen. I cancel every debt. Amen. I cancel every pressure. Amen. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I decree today change of mind, change of heart, and change of provision. I release to you today on the authority of God's word, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, royalties received. Hallelujah. I release to you the blessing. And when you receive it, remember, it says, do not forget the Lord your God who gave you the power and the ability to prosper and to create wealth. Give the Lord a praise. Yeah, give the Lord a praise. Oh, oh yeah. Amen.